Hello, welcome to another one of our wonderful book events. It's uh, an absolute honor to have um, Tim Marshall uh, joining us. It's, uh, uh, my name is Ben Morehouse. I'm owner of Our Bookshop in Tring. And uh, we've also got Max Baden over here, who's, um, who is son of Kim, Kim Baden, who uh, works in our shop. So it's a, uh, a mini family affair, affair tonight with, uh, with, with Max. So thank you, Max, for helping out. Um, so audience, please um, get involved. Um, along the bottom, you'll see a Q&A button. Please send your questions in. I will be messaging you um, in the next, over the next half an hour to, 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 to get your questions. And, um, but without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Max Baden. Max Baden, who's, um, whose job is, and I, I, I'm going to read this out, humanitarian advisor for Save the Children. So for him tonight is an utter joy and uh, desperately looking forward to this. So I'm, I'm very pleased for you, Max, and thank you very much, and I'll hand you over to you. Great. Uh, thanks, Ben. And uh, Tim, it's, it's fantastic to be here with you, uh, albeit online. Um, thank you. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to what I know will be a, a fascinating hour. Um, though we've never met in person, um, I feel like I know you quite well um, through reading both uh, Prisoners of Geography um, and now The Power of Geography. Um, and uh, I think going for a bit of a, a, a deeper tour into the power of geography um, tonight will, will, be, uh, will be very interesting. Um, and I'm looking forward to learning a bit of, about your motivations behind writing the book. Um, as both an experienced journalist and an author, I think uh, you told me spanning about 24 years at, at Sky News and uh, reporting from, from far 40 plus countries in several continents conflicts. Um, I'm sure you have a lot of personal stories uh, to tell, one or two which are which are littered in, in, in the power of geography, which I, I enjoyed uh, reading. Um, but maybe we can start with um, uh, you talking a bit about your inspiration uh, behind the powers of geography, as it mirrors the format um, of, of prisoners of, of geography looking through the, the lens of, of 10 maps. Yep. Uh, I should say thank you um, to Tring Bookshop for the invitation and thank you um, for you for your, your work here. And also to set the, um, the tone, I also want to say what an honour it is to be interviewed by the, the son of the great leader of North Korea. Um, because we wouldn't, as I'm about to depress you with tales of doom and gloom over the next half hour, I, I, you know, I think I need to get something off my chest, which is that I am actually quite an optimistic person about life and, and the future of the world in general. That said, um, yes, it's the same format. It's 10 chapters. Prisoners of Geography uh, try to set out the argument that the geography of a nation state, or even a region, partially determines what happens there. Uh, and if you don't understand that, you can read as much history as you like and as much current affairs as you like, but you're missing this vital thing. You know, what direction does that river flow? How high is that mountain? Can you fight there? Because I'm afraid a lot of it is predicated on, on, on the military aspect of things, because sadly, that's part of the human condition. And after five years, and it was reasonably successful, which I'm very grateful for, I thought it's worth looking again at this. So it's 10 completely different areas. But what I thought was, we're, we're now well into the multipolar world. My generation grew up in the bipolar world. It's pretty easy to understand many of the things that happened in the bipolar world and why they happened. In the multipolar world, there's all sorts of actors and there's all sorts of things like climate change, etc. So I chose various areas like the Sahel in, 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 uh, in, in Africa uh, space because it's a coming area of competition. Uh, the UK because of Brexit, um, Saudi Arabia because it has to diversify or die, and looked at it through the lens of the, the multipolar world, but with the caveat that most countries, I believe, are looking ahead a few years and they know it's going to be a, another bipolar world in very broad brush strokes, China and the USA. And some countries are hedging their bets. Some countries are using the time that their, America's attention is elsewhere to play. And some countries have made their choices. The UK and Australia clearly have made the choice of sticking with America. So that's the, the framework uh, of the book. Yeah, and I, I, I will lead you back 
to an optimistic question at the end, Tim, um, which uh, <laughs> will come through in the in the space chapter, which is, was a fascinating read. Um, I wondered if when you were writing Prisoners of Geography, if you had powers of geography in mind, because um, I, I found it quite interesting that there is um, Prisoners of Geography seems to look at a bit more at the macro level, whereas power of geography, you get into a bit more um, sort of detail around particular countries. And I guess that is um, in relation to this multipolar world that we're, we're in at the moment. Um, but also I found powers of geography talks around how geography can also be a sort of enabling factor of, of success potentially of a country. Maybe you yeah. could just speak a bit about that. It wasn't in my mind at all. Um, <clears throat> I mean, my, my stock phrase at the time was everyone's got a book in them, mine's out there, that's your lot. But then I went on to write various other books. And what, what actually happened was, um, came out of Prisoners of Geography, I followed it up with a book called um, Worth Dying For about flags, but it's not really about flags. They're just a vehicle to explain nationalism and identity and things, and a bit of history. I followed that up with Divided <laughs> because of all the barriers that, excuse me, have gone up around the world. Um, a third of all the countries in the world now wall or fence themselves off. Yeah, so it's a, it's a counter to the idea of the flat world of globalization. But, uh, and that was sold in America by the American publisher, publisher as a, a series uh, on identity. And, and it was, it was a trilogy. But no, I, know, I never thought of um, a follow-up until a couple of years ago. And then, if, as we said before, realized there's something in this. So Prisoners of Geography, does predicate, is predicated on that, that a country is locked into the prison, by which I, I, I don't mean that you can't do anything, but that whatever you do is within that frame. But you can bend the bars of the prison through technology. So power of geography um, takes that and then looks uh, in Ethiopia, for example, as a great example of being able to bend the bars, but you're still operating within the prism of geography. And that example is the, the Ethiopians, who my generation, I'm afraid its conception of it is the great famine of the, of the 80s, which um, propelled uh, Bob Geldof and the whole charity uh, thing, perhaps, I don't know, inspired you in your work for Save the Children. Um, but Ethiopia is building, has built the Grand, the, Grand the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which it says will produce enough electricity to give every single home in Ethiopia, and there's 110 million people there, electricity, free electricity. If that's the case, it's going to transform the country and transform the lives of people. So they've harnessed what previously was only used for drinking water, and fishing because it tumbles down really quickly over waterfalls and therefore it's no good for trade. They've harnessed that thing which actually held them back with 21st century technology and it's now going to allow them to hopefully progress. But it's still within what they can do with their geography and so it's still the, the prison of geography. Yeah, and I um, will come back to maybe why it's a bit of a blessing and a curse because there's this uh, tension in the region Egypt, with, with yeah. Egypt. Um, but maybe we'll just do a bit of a whistle stop tour of, of the chapters. Um, and you start with, with Australia, um, which um, given the, the sheer complexity of the history of Australia, um, you know, its colonial experimental past, um, the, the violence and discrimination against the Aboriginal culture, which you, which you touched upon. And now the sort of added layers of trauma around climate change and the, the tension between China and the US in, in the Indo-Pacific region. I mean, maybe you could just speak about um, almost Australia's sort of tightrope that it, that it feels like it's walking at the moment and, and where it's hedging its bets. It is still treading a tightrope, but, but in many respects, it's, Ball it, you, it's clearly going to fall off and it's going to fall off on the American side. A, a, a very um, knowledgeable um, British politician once said to me, um, you don't have to uh, join either camp sometimes, but it's very important where you put most of the weight, which foot is it on? New Zealand is still hedging its bets. Australia, it's clearly going to go with the Americans. 
And again, just a simple look at the map tells you so many things of where Australia is. Um, it's a democracy. It's in the middle of the Indo-Pacific region. It's the hinge between the two. Its greatest trade is with the Chinese, but its greatest friend is the Americans. So what do you do now? And until a year ago, it was hedging its bets. And then because of COVID, that's what's tipped it over. And that's China's behavior and China's bullying attitude to Australia. So brief history lesson. Back in 1941, Second World War, the Japanese were at the shores of Australia. They bombed Darwin. They were going to invade from Papua New Guinea. But New Guinea, as it was, it wasn't that at the time, but New Guinea. And the Australians said very clearly, we know the British aren't coming. They're pretty busy. The Americans are our new best friend. Why? Because they were the great naval power. So they switched to the Americans and they're still the great naval power. And at a time, and I, this is actually worthwhile if, if we had, I sent a few slides over, there's one of China's perspective of the world. At a time when the Australians are confident that China will break out from what's called the first island chain, it will come past this wall that the Chinese see in front of them, which is made up of Taiwan and the Philippines and Japan, which, you, which Ben is going to show us in a minute. And in naval terms, you see the gaps between these islands, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Taiwan, Japan. They're very easy to plug in naval terms, which puts a wall in front of China. Australia knows that China is going to try and break out past that wall. Well, the next island chain is, brings them to their shores. And so they've made this choice that to try to withstand Chinese pressure, they're going to stick with the Americans. And so far, so are the Japanese and so are the South Koreans and so, so is everybody in this wall. China hasn't got any friends. So Australia's position has, has made it seek a big friend. If the Americans made it clear over a period of years, they weren't going to back Australia. Australia would very quickly flip and become a friend of China's. We wouldn't have a choice. But because of history, geography, politics, and democracy, it's sticking with the, with the Americans. Climate change has given it a huge problem. Um, the Australians live, 85% of them, well, there's about 25 million, 85% of Australians live in that arc from Brisbane down to uh, Sydney, Canberra, um, Melbourne, and, and round to Adelaide, 85%. And why? Because that's where what little water they have is. Um, that needs to be defended. For that, you need a big navy for that entire continent. They haven't got a population that can grow big enough to have a massive navy. So automatically, because of geography and water and the place, they must look abroad for a friend, preferably one with ships. It used to be the British. Now it's the Americans because of their trade lanes. Um, and they've made, they've made their bet for the 21st century. Yeah. Um, I think I could talk to you for most of the day about um, Chinese global influence and the Belt and Road Initiative, um, but I'm sure we'll touch upon it in other chapters as you do in the book. Um, but I, I was particularly captivated by the chapter on Iran. Um, as, as politically, you sort of talk about uh, how it's not been able to sort of let go of this idea of, of revolution, um, but it, but it's also a particular moment in the book where you talk about a you know a personal um, uh, moment um, where you were caught up in the streets in in the two thousand and nine election. Um, I mean, maybe you could just talk a bit about uh, that day uh, and perhaps uh, the fault lines that maybe have opened up um, from from that period of time and and how that shaped to where shaped where Iran is now. Yeah, it was, um, <clears throat> I'm really fascinated by police states and dictatorships and how people live in them, uh, especially um, the, 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 the thinking class, if you like, you know, how on earth do you operate within a police state? Um, the Iranian one is actually more loose than Iraq. Iraq, really, you didn't even dare say anything about Saddam in private. In Iran, there's a bit more space. 
But clearly the election had been stolen again. Um, demonstrations came, but it was absolutely fascinating. We were walking down the main street the day after the election. And I was with an Iranian friend. And as we passed them, people kept going, whispering to him, what? And he said, they're saying such and such a square, six o'clock. And everyone they passed, six o'clock. Because, you know, you don't want to go on the internet because the authorities are watching. You don't want to phone, listening. So we went to this place and the demonstrations broke out and the rioting began and it all got very hairy. And I ended up um, being treated by a doctor after meeting the Tehran police. But that's a minor issue compared to their struggle. And they lost. And they lost because the state has still got the firm grip on Iran. And contrary to what much of the reporting you see, the entire country is not desperate to get rid of the mullahs and because it's a conserv large parts of it are conservative still. And this stock phrase I have is that too many journalists land at Tehran, go up to North Tehran to the university where they know they can find English speakers and they interview people that do want change. And that's good, but they don't interview the people that don't want change. And so I think there's a slight false impression. Okay, fast forward all the way to now. There's, it's the election next week, actually, presidential election. The fix is already in in Iranian politics. The um, Guardian Council basically says, yes, you can stand for president, you can't stand for president. And the credentials are, do you support the system? You're in. Do you not support the system? You're out. And it's even more than that. Do you support the Supreme? You know, it, but basically, you've got to support the system to, to even get in. So we, we know what the result will be. The result will be someone who wants to perpetuate the system. Actually, this time it's going to be almost certainly a hard liner that takes over, which has other ramifications for global politics and the nuclear deal. But that's how they maintain control with a sham democracy, a dictatorial police state, cowing people. And the type of people that would come to an event like this retreat into the private sphere um, and they wait. At some point, of course, the dictatorship will lose. All systems crumble, but for the now, for now, and I've had lots of Iranian dissidents over the years come to me, Tim, you must understand it's about to crack. And it's wishful thinking. Yeah, and there's, um, you, I mean, there's lots we could dig into about the sort of Middle East uh, politics and, and how, um, sort of the, the religious tensions as well, um, Shia and, and Sunnis, um, and even the, the fraction, the, the sort of fractures within those religions as well. But, but maybe, I mean, you said earlier about um, Saudi Arabia, which is another chapter in this book, obviously has a lot of tension with Iran. Um, and you, you talked about how Saudi Arabia needs to uh, diversify or, or die. And I wonder if you could just talk about um, the sort of way that Saudi Arabia has been built on the foundation of, of oil and, and how that shaped the social dynamic in the country yeah. and what they're trying to do in order to, um, in, in order to diversify. Very briefly, we need to go back to the beginning, which is that this small obscure tribe called the Saud tribe uh, married into the small obscure religious guys called the Wahhabi tribe intermarried and the two pillars of Saudi Arabia is the house of side for the politics the Wahhabis for the religion and that goes all the way through to now this is about 300 years ago in the 20s in this ultra conservative place they find oil there's only two million of them imagine the untold riches even now untold riches but now there's 25 27 million of them what happens to that 27 million when nobody wants to buy their product anymore? What else have they got? How do you sustain your 27 million people who at the moment get all these subsidies? You don't. Part that. Second part of this relates back to Iran. If the oil is no longer as important and over 20 to 30 years, it won't be. And this is the, the positive thing about the Saudi leadership of which there are not that many 
positive things to say. They have read the future. They know the Americans are going. They know their security umbrella will go away because the Americans are not going to fight for their solar panels. They know Iran's still going to be there. So what do you do? Um, and that's why this young leadership in the Crown Prince, when he's not allegedly dismembering people in the Turkish embassy, um, is positive. He's bringing women into the workforce in order to Saudify the workforce because they know they can't rely on the 10 million foreign workers. They're going to push them out slowly, which is another problem itself. They're going to relax some of them. They've already got the cinemas open again after 30 years. Hallelujah. Um, and they're diversifying the economy. It's called the, the, the uh, Vision 2030. Solar panels, they got a lot of sun. Sand, they genuinely actually can sell it. Um, they're doing a bunch of things, tourism, to diversify the economy. They want to be in a position when the Americans have gone and nobody's buying the product, that they're still a self-sustaining country that can sustain 27 million people. They need to do something else, either make friends with the Iranians, and considering that the House of Saud regards itself as the custodian of Islam and the two holy places, Mecca and Medina, and the, the Shia mullahs in Iran feel exactly the same way. They're God's plan for the world, not the Sunni and the Shia, uh, the uh, Saudis. It's probable that a detente will be very difficult. They are both actually trying now. Saudis have got a fallback plan. Israel. They can't do it yet because the king is completely against it. The, um, the UAE has made peace with Israel. The Moroccans have made peace. The Sudanese, Jordan, Egypt. It's a new era. And even the recent problems didn't break this new era. And it's probable, possible. When the king dies, the crown prince will make peace with Israel. Why? Not because he likes Jews and the Israelis, but because they're the most powerful nation around in the region and the Iranians are still going to be there. So from diversification and, the, or, and us weaning ourselves off oil, all these geopolitics flow. Geography. <laughs> exactly. Um, it's interesting. So we've got the, uh, the post-oil vision in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, I'm not sure we've got a post yet yeah, got a post Brexit vision in the UK, um, but you do talk about um, the UK and, and Brexit in a in a chapter, um, and I thought what was quite interesting, um, two interesting things for me. One was how you were drawing some some interesting conclusions about how the UK navigated itself in the post colonial world and sort of making some. Um, are drawing some similarities to how it needs to navigate in the post-Brexit world. Um, but I wondered if you could also talk about why the UK will still maintain a particularly prominent position in the world due to its geographical yeah. location. Well, I, I argue it will maintain, I mean, we're the fifth or sixth biggest economy in the world. I argue it will if we get the politics and the economics yeah. right. Uh, and again, I sent in this slide to give us a different view of where we are in the world. And Ben, even now, is, yeah, see, he's, he's pressing buttons and, oh, there we go. I think that's a really interesting view of the world. Sorry, of, of uh, Britain's place in the world, the UK's place in the world. What you see there is um, <laughs> how much of Europe sees us. You look at that jagged coastline, that jagged coastline means um, ports, deep water ports, we have them. It usually means long rivers, flat, long rivers that come a long way inland, fantastic for trade. We're in a great position. We are already in the great sea lanes of the world. You can't block us. I mean, you look at Russia, we, we may come to that at some point, but look at Russia. If it wants to come out of the Black Sea, that's a hard route. That's worse than getting from, let's say, oh, I don't know, Tring to Essex, which is pretty hard. So indented in a jagged coastline, fantastic access to the sea lanes, 
deep water ports, uh, long rivers, and right in front of you, the richest, biggest market in the world, the EU. 350 million relatively well-off people relative to most of the world. So if we get our politics and economics right, we are in a very, very good position to carry on. So the current administration is looking for global Britain, which I know it's a hackneyed phrase and it's ill-defined, but there's an example um, coming up, which is that Japan is trying to facilitate the UK joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, because <laughs> as you know, we're a great Pacific power. Um, I mean, that's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? There's actually a lot of similarities between the Japanese and the British um, islands states, but we haven't got time for that. Britain's actually in, 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 in a good geographic place to embrace its new uh, political position. I'm not making an argument for or against Brexit. This isn't to do with that. It's to do with where we are. And where we are because of our geography and our history and our politics is in a good position that if we get things right, to continue to be a major world power. But you, um, you do also refer to how you think that um, uh, an independent Scotland might cause more havoc than um, sort of Britain, you know, UK's post-Brexit reality. Maybe you could just talk a bit about why that would be such a problem for yeah. the UK. And, and well, I guess this is a difficult question to answer, but do you think it will happen? That's much more difficult. <laughs> um, I'll try and be brief. For 400 years, the UK looked across at Europe and tried to balance everybody. British power only really took off after the Acts of Union, 1707, when the back door to an invasion of England was locked. The French could no longer have a war on two fronts, their friends in Scotland allowing them to come over and come down south and simultaneously come across the channel. That was, the back door was locked. And from there, Britain began to really accelerate. Well, the back door is still going to be locked. Um, but Britain's would Britain would lose the rump UK would have had, what is it, a third of its territory at least gone. Uh, five or six million people gone. Its stature as a big nation state severely diminished in a way that it hasn't been because of Brexit. People understand the problems of Brexit and, and the diminished um, purchasing power. But there is a flip side to that and that, that people know they can do bilateral deals and that hasn't diminished UK's power. So if it was diminished because of the reasons I've said and Britain's nuclear deterrent, which is parked in the, in the Clyde at Faslane, and the SNP is absolutely wedded to uh, a nuclear-free Scotland. By the way, it couldn't join NATO because of that. You have to not ask what's in the ship that's docking. So they couldn't join NATO. Um, Britain would lose its nuclear deterrent. It hasn't got anywhere to put these submarines. So I, th I think it's, it's, its stature in that sense would be diminished. I think a second referendum is inevitable um, because for the Scottish nationalists, it's a lifetime dream and work. You know, why would you ever let that go? And I'm, this again is not for or against it. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying they're stupid, but I, I'm reminded of the communists who after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there were, to, to the vast majority of people, and to actually most communists, the lie was seen, you know, the great lie of the communist decades of, of, of prosperity and them being decent political system that didn't actually kill 50 million people and all the rest of it. You know, the lie was laid bare. And most communists realized and they began to do other things. But there were significant amount of communists who just could not let go of their life's work. Uh, and they, uh, to this day, some of them are carrying on fighting for a system like the Soviet Union, Marxist, Leninists, Revolutionary Communist Party, etc. Because they can't let go of it. I'm not comparing them in their 
let's say, naivety and refusal to understand what happened, you know, in the death and destruction and tragedy of the Soviet Union, but to understand that some people find it very difficult to let go. And the SNP, why would they? It's what they believe deep in their hearts. So they're not going to let go. So there will be at some point a second referendum. Will it be won? Depends on the atmosphere and the politics at the time. And also partially depends on how well Brexit goes. So I don't know the answer because that's the future. Yeah, it was a horrible question. Um, I do feel it's a, it might be a bit of a, a rocky road for the UK over the next few years. Um, but there's there's brilliant chapters also on, on Greece and Turkey that, that we don't have a lot of time to, to dive into. But I mean, maybe you could just talk about, you know, one thing that I think was really interesting is that maybe a lot of people assume that in Europe, at least, the biggest tension at the moment is between Russia and Ukraine, potentially, or, or Russia and, you know, a lot of the powers in, in Europe. But actually, uh, you referred to Greece and Turkey uh, and the situation there as partic being particularly tense. And um, there's almost a spark now coming that's, that may light, light the flame of, of potential war. Could you maybe just talk a bit around the tension there and, and what it's, um, what's happening? I think Russia-Ukraine is actually a bigger flashpoint. Um, <clears throat> that's because you're dealing with Putin, who's not a gambler, but if he sees the opportunity, will will move. But at the moment, no, um, especially well for various reasons. So, Turkey, Greece, there are the restraining factors are that one of them's in the EU and that both are in NATO. And if shots are fired, which is plausible the phone lines would ring red hot. You can't have two NATO powers having a war. Um, but the tensions are, are because the Aegean is a Greek lake for historical reasons going back to the 1920s. Um, Greece, uh, sorry, Turkey has something called the blue homeland theory, uh, blue homeland concept. And the blue homeland is that this is their natural borders. Some of it goes back to the Ottoman empire and what they lost in the 1920s. And um, unfortunately, part of the Blue Homeland is in Greek waters. That's problematic enough. But when you find oil and gas in those waters, which Turkey claims, then you've got a raison d'etre to potentially push your claim, which is what's going on at the moment. It's got very, very rocky, very tense. They have literally bumped into each other, the two navies. They have actually touched. The air forces every day do that. Um, France is clearly backing Greece, sent its aircraft carrier there to the Aegean last year. So it's a, it's a flashpoint in Europe. One that I think calmer heads can deal with. But if you, if you don't know any Greeks or any Turks, or rather if you do know any Greeks and any Turks, you probably know just the depth of feeling there is uh, about each other. Um, most people completely reasonable, but there's a lot of history there. Yeah, and you go into some of the history in the book around you know why there's the, the resentment potentially there. Um, and we don't have time to go into Turkey in detail, but um, we can kind of link it to the Sahel because um, mm. obviously one of the things that's affecting Europe is the, the migration crisis yes. at the moment. Um, and Turkey obviously has... Um, uh, you talk about Turkey having a sort of ability to have a hold on on the tap of, of the migration through that route, but maybe um, you can you can um, uh, talk more about what's happening in the Sahel at the moment because I think there's an interesting um, sentence that you say in the Sahel, which is um, anyone unwilling to tackle the underlying issues driving the conflicts is doomed to failure. I wondered if you could just talk a bit about the underlying issues in the Sahel and maybe yeah. maybe explain the geography of the Sahel first, because it's well, um, an interesting region and why, why it's such a big problem for Europe. Sorry, Max. That's why I'm, I'm in a minority of people that want to actually increase the foreign aid budget, not cut it. For, for, That's good well, for us. Yeah, for <laughs> alter, you can do it for, for, for the best intentions. You can actually do it for selfish reasons as well, but I'll come back to that. Um, yeah, basically, we bribed the EU to turn the tap off. I mean, Turkey, to its credit, has taken in three million refugees and, and done a hell of a lot for them. You can't take that away from them. But they also, I believe, use 
migrants as a political weapon. They open the gate, they turn the tap on when they want to annoy Turkey, uh, Greece and other people. And the EU, including us when we were in it, bribed them with 6 billion euros. Uh, we'll give you this, make sure nobody comes. And it's sort of held. Go down to the Sahel and again, Ben, you're on. Big strip of land below the Sahara Desert. Uh, there are five main Sahelian countries. All of them are in serious trouble. All of them have uh, what are essentially a tribal disputes. All of them have Al Qaeda and ISIS operating in numbers, thousands of deaths. In Mali, Niger, Chad, uh, there are 5,000 French troops fighting at the invitation of those countries. There are about 300 British troops, including combat units are fighting in the Sahel. And that's because if any of these countries implode, the rate of migration that we're seeing at the moment will rapidly increase and they will go most of them northwards, not all, into the North Africa. You probably saw the news recently in Morocco, in, uh, Tunisia, Morocco, sorry. Yes, Morocco, of uh, 8,000 people crossed in one day from the Spanish exclave on the shores of Morocco. So Ella, they, the Moroccans basically opened the fence or basically said, you can go. And 8,000 people rocked up on that shore, hoping to go across that gap into Spain. Well, that's exactly where the people in the Sahel would head. Morocco, Tunisia, Libya. Libya is a failed state. Morocco and Tunisia are not, but could be. Imagine the pressure on North Africa and people are not gonna stop there. And if those areas are destabilized, they're gonna keep coming further. And if Britain took, let's say, oh, a million people, drop in the ocean. I've seen this great video where there's like 20 jars of Smarties, you know, big like litre bottles of Smarties. And one country takes one Smartie out, which is a million people, says, there, we've done our bit. And then you look at these 20 litre bottles of Smarties. That's why I don't think that accelerating migration is a good idea. And I don't think taking mass migration is a good idea. It empties out these countries of the people they need, and it destabilizes the places that they're going to. So let's not cut the aid budget, unless you want lots and lots and lots more people trying to cross the channel. So you can do it for selfish reasons, but increase the aid budget. I mean, the other, the other interesting thing you talk about in the Sahel and one of the drivers of mass migration is, is climate change, which you refer yeah. to throughout the book, but particularly you talk about it in the Sahel um, and sort of from, you know, you talk about the change in climate over a long period of history, but actually from the 1950s, you talk about the sort of uh, human causes of, of climate change. I mean, maybe you could just talk about what is happening in terms of the climate in the Sahel and why that's also driving migration as well as the conflict that's, that's happening there. Sahel and then across a bit in Sudan. Um, briefly, you probably remember the headlines about Darfur about um, five, six years ago, the, the four people. Um, that conflict was partially driven by the fact that the four people in Darfur are sedentary and the nomadic tribes above them, uh, the areas they could graze their cattle in, the Sahara is coming down, desertification, you haven't got any where for your crops to, your cattle to eat. If they don't eat, you don't eat and you die. You're not going to say, well, I'll tell you what, we won't go to the region down there. Of course you're going to move. And they moved. And it, other factors as well. There are similar stories in each of the Sahelian countries. So desertification is, is a real issue. There's been some great on paper initiatives. You probably know about the green wall. They were going to, they did plant a million trees across the, stop, the top. But I'd sometimes think that aid agencies, including your own, I'm sorry, journalists are very good at criticizing because we don't have to actually do anything. We can only point out problems. But organizations, including your own, I think have fantastic solutions. And they do these solutions and they go away. 
because your budgets don't build in going back and back and back. Water pumps are a great example. You build a water pump, fantastic, fine. But you haven't trained anybody to mend the water pumps when they break. And you haven't got the budget. To... Sorry, I'm digressing. So, for example, the million trees, the green wall, which are going to stop desertification, they built them, but they built them in areas that they planted them. They built them in areas where there was no one to take care of them and water them. And the people who herd their cattle, nomadics, thought, fantastic, here's some trees, go and eat that. And they ate them all. So I just think some of these schemes need better thinking out and, and the, 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 they also build in to the budgets, sustainability and training local people, A, how to build more water, wells and be how to maintain them because again what some of your charities do is they claim success and they do fantastic work and my heart goes out to people that do it but then they move on to something else and they also are competing for funds so you get the headlines we've built this amount of wells great next i think um, like i said it's very easy for journalists to criticize Forgive me. We could have a long, cold beverage, Tim, about all the flaws in the humanitarian system, but uh, maybe another day we'll, we'll do that. If we didn't um, have you, we'd have to invent you. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll, I'll skip over Ethiopia and Spain, although if there's time, we'll, we'll come back to them. But I really want to get to the chapter on, on space, because that was such a brilliant ending to the, the book, uh, in my opinion. Um, and what I really liked about this chapter is that you brought in the geography of of space mm. and I, I just wonder if you could talk about the importance of the control of the low earth orbit which is something you re refer to and um uh, and almost uh, you can sort of give similarities maybe to how it, it's quite it's quite similar to what a choke point would be on yeah. on earth so sort of where um it, you know where a country can control a certain area that will affect ev you know everything else really around the world yeah, I wanted to get across the concept of, of looking at space as a geographic area, not just sort of out there. And the way I did it was, yeah, you, you choose the choke points on Earth, the Suez Canal, the Malacca Strait, the Strait of Hormuz, etc. And you saw what happened recently when that guy couldn't drive his boat in a straight line down the Suez Canal. These are the choke points of, of Earth, and we've always competed for them, and now we cooperate with them. I'm hoping we're doing the same in space. So there are similar ones. Think of space in a geographic sense, that there are oceans of gravity. And you want, might want to be in the best part of those oceans. And there are mountains of radiation belts where you really don't want to go through those radiation belts. They'll kill you. And there are fantastic locations. And one of them is low Earth orbit. That's where we put the satellites. Increasingly, the satellites control everything we do. I suspect what we're doing now is something to do with the satellite somewhere. So if we know our history and we know how we competed for these choke points, are we going to do the same in space? Probably. Because I'm not going to allow, if I'm a dominant power, another dominant power to control this band. I'm going to make sure I'm out there. So we're all out there now, the dominant powers, but let's talk about the three big ones, Russia, China, USA. If one of them decided they wanted to dominate a mo an, an, in a superior manner, the other two would get very nervous and you would start arming your satellites so that nobody could come and, this is genuinely possible, throw paint on them to blind you, genuinely possible, crash into you, genuinely possible, fire a laser at you, already happened in a test by the Russians. They tested one of their own satellites, not a competitor. Well, it therefore follows that if people started doing that, you would start uh, arming your own satellites with defensive measures. They would bristle with weapons. So I'm afraid that is potential future unless we can completely cooperate in this, this incredibly hostile space. And the other one is the moon. We've already, some countries, have, have agreed spheres of influence. Well, there's an echo of history there, isn't there? And that doesn't really go well, usually. Because if you've said that's your sphere of influence, who the hell are you? It's the moon. No, it's my sphere of influence. Or it's... So that's already happening. And um, the last thing I'd, I'd say about this is that our 
laws, such as they are, are 50 years out of date. There is the, people always say, well, there's the Outer, Outer Space Treaty and the Moon Treaty. But yeah, sure, they're bits of paper that people didn't usually sign or ratify. And anyway, they were written in the 60s. And I'll give you an example. Um, after the First World War at Versailles, Germany was not allowed to have certain types of weapons. So all through the 20s and even into the 30s, they weren't allowed to have certain types of weapons. But nobody knew about rockets then, or at least they were just on the drawing board. So Germany actually looked at the loophole and began what was, became the V1 and the V2 rocket system because nobody could stop them. There was no law. Well, our laws are, you cannot have weapons of mass destruction in space, nuclear weapons. Fine. Nothing about lasers. So, so they're 50 years out of date. So we need to get some legal framework and understanding to govern this new area of what will be an area of competition. And I hope cooperation, because there are many examples of us cooperating as well. Um, I'm going to do one last question as I've seen Ben has come in and I'm sure there's some audience questions to come. Go for it, um, Go for it. But I, uh, I mean, you talked about loopholes and there's an absolutely brilliant story, which was a laugh out loud moment for me in the book <laughs> around Dennis Hope, which I thought was fantastic. And maybe you can briefly talk about that one. But actually, I wanted to, um, uh, the one that I just, I couldn't get my head around was the Pioneer plaque, which I know we've got a picture of. Um, and I would love you just to explain to the audience about the Pioneer plaque. because Come back to that. On, we man. never would have known about it. Um, so yeah, go right. ahead. This, you've read it, I haven't read it for a few months. Um, the original Moon Treaty was written with nation states in mind, not commercial companies. So, you know, yeah, we agree, nobody can own the moon. That's out of date anyway, because Bezos might get there and start digging up minerals or whatever. Um, but this enterprising gentleman who used to sell used cars, you'll not be surprised, realized there was this loophole about, doesn't say anything about individuals. And he began selling acres of the moon at like $20 a piece. And he sold millions of acres of the moon and he's made himself a multimillionaire. So if you want to own a bit of the moon, find out who this guy is, send him your $20 and you can get a little certificate and everything, you know, it's clearly you really, you really do own a bit of the moon. And I think I said in the book, and if you believe that, I've got a bridge to sell you. So I'm mean, sure it's just a bit of fun, but it's a genius thing. Right, other genius thing, Carl Sagan, amazing American astronomer, a fantastic book called Pale Blue Dot, uh, deceased now, sadly. He co-designed this map. I think it went on the Voyager. It's called the Pioneer Plaque. Ben, you're on. And this, this, this plaque is on Voyager, which has already gone so far we've lost contact with it. And it's heading out there in case anybody finds it, in which case they've got a map to get back to us. And I ask you, is that wise? Because I th again, I think I said in the, in the book, what if they're not vegetarians? It's a brilliant map. Look, on the right hand side, this is what these funny bags of water look like. It's a line from Star Trek, funny bags of water. They are different to each other. Some of them look like this. They can move because one's doing something that the other one isn't. And on the left, there's this map. And the big long uh, line coming down to the bottom of the screen takes you back to our sun. And then from there, it's a short hop to our planet. I'm really not convinced that's a good idea. Um, on the plus side, because the solar system revolves over several million years, as long as nobody finds it for several million years, the GPS system will have changed and they'll end up in a, a hypermarket on planet Zog, not us. <laughs> there you go. Great, thanks, Tim. Uh, ben, I'll hand over to you for, I think we've got some questions from the audience. Oh, we do, we do. Don't go anywhere, Max, though, because uh, I want you to keep um, commenting. Um, Jonathan, uh, Atkins. Um, so we're obviously jumping through subjects that have been covered through the event. So, uh, um, so Jonathan asked, isn't China going to be a, a more reliable guardian for so many countries in the world because they can provide more consistent support than an unstable democracy like, like the US? No. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, I'll give you a bit. I'll give you an example of consistent support. Hi, Sri Lanka. You can't afford your port, 
don't worry, we'll lend you the money. Here's all the money. Go and build your port. They can't pay it back. Five years later, what do you mean you can't pay it back? Right, we'll write it off. It's our port now, okay? Fantastic. China now has a port in Sri Lanka. Fantastic. They are replicating this pretty impressive business model around the world. It's not me. My phone's off. <laughs> not me. <laughs> not me either. Um, <laughs> oh, look, there's a, there's, a, there's a million examples. Um, um, oh, yeah. Say so one wrong thing about the Politburo and the Chinese system. Well, we saw what happened to uh, Australia. They called for an independent investigation into where COVID comes from. Before you know it, um, their entire wine imports to China, have, which was a third of the Australian wine industry, cut. And that was just the least damaging to their economy. So you better, not, they are, they're great, as long as you don't say anything about them. If you want to put your trust in a police state that locks up a million Uyghurs in, 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 in concentration camps, as opposed to an incredibly flawed and in many areas racist democracy, that's your choice. Mm, tough one. <laughs> um, Stuart Green, great insight, Tim. Do you subscribe to the view that there may be, um, may be future conflicts over the supply of water? There was a book, very influential book written in the 70s called Water Wars, and we've been waiting for one ever since. And that's not to say there isn't going to be one. Um, and, and there very nearly have been. Um, Turkey and Syria, I think in the 80s, Turkey and Iraq in the 90s. Ethiopia and Egypt are uh, very tense, and the Ethiopian uh, have threatened war. Uh, President Sisi said all options are on the table because of this dam in Ethiopia. I don't think they can pull it off, but that's not the point. The point is that they're threatening war over it. So yes, with the greater stresses that we have because of climate change, I think the threat of water wars are increased. It's an increasingly important um, uh, resource, so yeah. How does that, did that come into your work, Max? Are you um, involved in any of that? Uh, I mean, we do, you know, we have a, a um, water and uh, sanitation unit um, across several of, of the organisations that work within Save the Children. Um, so we do a, a lot of work around this, um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing that, um, yeah, as Tim said, water is, is an increasingly important resource, uh, as are other things that sustain human life. Um, so uh, actually, one of my questions to Tim was almost, you know, are we going to see that, you know, resources that sustain human life, are they going to actually become uh, more uh, important and powerful than, say, you know, precious metals and things that we've, we've tended to to lord over and i know you've, you've talked about you talk about precious metals in in the sahel region um but um and on the asteroids yeah. and the asteroids which we're going to mine at some point um so yeah we we do do some of that uh, of, of that work at least rowena asks um where does south america sit in terms of global politics and power Growing, diminishing, static, or irrelevant? No, not irrelevant, static. Martin Sorrell, uh, the advertising guru, um, is uh, brilliant at what he does, but he said at the beginning of the 90s, this is Latin America's decade. And people say that at the beginning of every decade, and it's never true. And that's partially, the po well, it's mostly the politics. The geography of Latin America, it's not brilliant because it is sort of down there, away from the main action of, of the heartland across the top. Uh, so, you know, Russia, China, America, across that heartland. Um, but they can overcome it, but their politics is, is, uh, has held them back uh, to a great extent. Argentina was the seventh biggest economy in the world in 1907. Now it's not in the top 20. Um, so I, I, I think they will just keep moving along pretty much where they are. Uh, they have massive problems, social problems, as, as you know, um, poverty problems. They should be a lot richer than they are, but the degree of um, 
corruption, violence, gang warfare, poverty. It just seems to be a cycle. Very briefly, they got it wrong from the beginning. <clears throat> when they went and stole, <clears throat> when the colonialists went and stole the land, they replicated the old country's political system of feudalism, basically, of great landowners. And they didn't do anything to develop it. And they just robbed it blind and took it all back to Spain and Portugal. And, and they're still suffering because of that, the infrastructure. In America, once they'd stolen the land, they pretty much gave it away, incentivizing people to build it up. Completely different models. And there are greater geographic advantages to the North America, well, to the USA. Um, but it is that partially that politics and economics, which if you get that wrong, even if you've got the right geography, it's going to hold you back and it still holds them back. And, uh, and Tim, I mean, you, you, you have a chapter on Spain in the book, which has obviously had a huge influence in, in Latin America or Latin American history. Um, and um, uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about Spain, but I wonder if you could briefly um, touch upon the geography of Spain, because I think it's very interesting because you, you speak about Spain as sort of a fortress from the outside, if you look at the, the geography, but actually the, it, it's held it back in terms of its cohesiveness as, yeah. a, as a nation. Uh, and maybe you could also link that to the political movement in Catalonia um, and also, you know, previously the militarized, you know, the military movement in the Basque country as well. It is a bit of a fortress in that from pretty much any direction <clears throat> you approach it, immediately up come the mountains. And then on that plateau, um, there are no more mountain ranges. And all this geography has uh, militated against cohesion. Because the Catalan area, I mean, in, in the UK, um, apart from a few people, everyone speaks one language. The geography of Spain militated against that. It's why the Catalonians still speak Catalonian, Basques, etc. And even the Galicians have a very distinct um, dialect. And it's Castilian, of course. And it's because they were quite regionally cut off from each other and the rivers didn't link. Um, and they grew up really as different regions, even the con uh, recon <coughs> Reconquista uh, against um, Islam came down in sections. It didn't come down as one. And it's, it's always held them back. And to this day, it holds them back. And it's one of the reasons why Catalonia still has, some of them have dreams of independence and some Basques. And the Basques have been placated because they've been granted a serious amount of autonomy, as in fact have the Catalonians. Um, yeah, but it, 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 that, that is mostly explained by geography. And it's, it's a knock-on effect. You know, it doesn't just start when there is one Spain, albeit with regions. It's then replicated through each generation. Um, I'm trying to think of examples. Uh, the, the Spanish Civil War divides them. Um, and there are other examples through history. Ben, I don't know if we've got time for one more question um, go on, if you've got one, go for it. If wrap up. Um, hey, Tim, one, one thing that came through to me, maybe as a, a subtle underlying theme in the book, um, actually both in Prisoners of Geography and Power of Geography, is around leadership. Um, and I think you your phrase was, geography is not fate, people get a choice, but it matters. Um, and to me, that really sp speaks to sort of leadership and the power dynamics within, within the country. I wonder if you could talk to instances about where leaders have been able to shape their fates through their understanding of geography. And particularly in Powers of Geography, um, you talk to both Usman Ghazi, who in the late 1200s, I mean, almost was sort of the founder of the Ottoman Empire, um, and also Emperor Haile Selassie the I in, e in Ethiopia. Um, and maybe you could just talk to one of those examples of where they've really been able to sort of shape shape the, the power of that country over a certain period of time due to their understanding of the geography? They are legion. Um, Muhammad is a great example of a leader that created a geographic space, which is Islam. Um, put against that is Charles Martel, uh, the French leader, who was, I believe he was the grand 
father of Charlemagne. Charlemagne, yeah. Yeah. Who stopped Islam coming up through Europe. And that was the foundation of the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither Holy Roman or an empire, I know, but Charlemagne shaped the concept of Christendom, now outdated. Uh, oof. I mean, there are there are so many. Um, those are those are two ancient ones. I'm trying to think of something more modern. Oh, B Bolivar, Simon Bolivar, in Latin America, um, shaped nation state independence from the Spanish colonialists and, and created a geographic space which is Latin America, which is not. Uh, Spanish colonies. So there are others, um, and then there are others who completely fail through their perhaps lack of understanding of geography. You could, I mean, there's other factors. Napoleon and Hitler are two potential examples of not really understanding the Russian winter, but of course it's not as simple as that. You know, there are many other factors involved in those two abject failures. But Napoleon yeah, Napole Napoleon's complete misunderstanding of um, mind you, he thought he could get he thought he could get Moscow before the winter. He didn't, and it all went it all went Pete Tong from there, as I believe the French say. Mm. <laughs> Listen, all good things must come to an end. I'm actually going to just share one more photo because I just need it explaining uh, more than anything else. Um, Tim sent a lot of photos earlier. And, um... Only because you asked me. <laughs> no, get out of it. Um, ah. What, what's going on here? Um, that's Helmand province in Afghanistan. We were in what's called a FOB, a forward operating base. And I came across uh, this mural. That's a Leeds United away shirt from the 1950s. <laughs> um, wherever I used to go, uh, well, wherever I go, I take a lead shirt with me. I've left several of them scattered around the world, including in Iraq. Um, I was told under no circumstances to wear it outside of the forward operating base, as it's a little bright. And given the conditions we were operating in, you really didn't want to attract attention to yourself. That's that story. Right. OK. And there just happened to be a Yorkshire badge on the wall. Just, Just... Just came across it. I didn't do it, I promise. I didn't do it. <laughs> randomly, randomly. Oh, listen, thank you, Tim. You're, a, you're It's just been a wonderful hour. And honestly, Max thank and you, you you, you, um, you could have talked for hours, I suspect. And Max, thank you People so People do much. say that. <laughs> Max, <laughs> this first event Max has done for us, and uh, it won't be the last. I, I trust Max, so don't... Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Max. Thank you, thank you very Tim. much for thank guiding you. me through. Uh, no, lovely to speak to you. So thank you, audience, for all uh, joining us. Uh, and thank you once again to our, our, our two panellists. And uh, we'll see you again. We've got a live event on Thursday, Stacey, uh, Stacey Hall's Thursday evening. That's a physical event. So if you fancy actually seeing author live yeah, in person, <laughs> there you go, random thing, entering. And, uh, and we've got stacks of other events. So do keep an eye on our website. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Good night.